Welcome to the Radiant Visalia podcast. Join us at one of our two services, 9 a.m. and 1045 a.m. Download the Church Center app or visit our website, radiantvisalia.com, to stay connected with us. All right, enjoy. take time um, each uh, Sunday to open the Word of God, and, and that's, that's why um, the Word of God changes lives, and He sets things in motion through His Word that just can't be stopped. So would you stand with me as I read 2 Corinthians 1 as a way of honoring God's Word to us? 2 Corinthians 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our Our hope for you is unshaken. For we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and He will deliver us. On Him we have set our hope that He will deliver us again. You also must help us by prayer, so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted to us through the prayers of many. You may be seated. This week, I attended uh, the funeral of Steve Harms, who was the pastor of Neighborhood Church. And as you would expect, the funeral was packed. It was packed with people Uh, receiving comfort in different ways. Because I knew I'd be teaching on this passage, I was watching the ways that we comfort ourselves. And for most there, knowing that Steve knew Jesus and was with Jesus brought great comfort It was said over and over again that his life did not end, but eternity had just begun. And it was bringing many, most, comfort. This idea that we would see Steve again was bringing the whole group comfort. For some, uh, laughing brought comfort. There was a lot of laughing at the funeral. Steve's stories were flowing and reminding us that Steve lived a full life even though it ended too soon. For some, the music and the song brought deep uh, comfort. For others, just being together in community and finding a shoulder to cry on brought comfort. Traditions and rituals, they actually bring us comfort. How many of you have ever done something you thought, you know, well, for the holidays, we're just going to do something different, 
and found yourselves craving some of the same old traditions, some of the same old rituals. I've had conversations with people that return from like Maui. Well, I went to Maui for Christmas break, and you think, well, it's the ultimate Christmas vacation. And then they say, you know, I just wanted a Christmas tree. I found myself over the palm trees longing for a Christmas tree. Just wanted it to be a little colder than it was. Just missed the people that I'm usually around. There's great comfort in our traditions and great comfort in rituals. That's why we do them over and over again. There's comfort in a good cry. There's a ton of comfort in a good laugh. There's a ton of comfort in connecting with others, laughing with them, crying with them. There's comfort in food. And we do all of these things when we suffer. When we're suffering, uh, we seek comfort. When you're in trouble, where do you go? When you're suffering, what are your go-tos, the things that bring you comfort? I know that for some of us, we, we shop, we spend. It brings great comfort to escape through spending and shopping. For some of us, sex brings comfort. Food, there's a whole category of food called comfort food, and dare I say, it works. Some of us, our go-to is gossip. It's just really comforting to get some people on our side, so can you believe what she did to me? Self-pity is an escape brings us comfort, to comfort ourselves. For most of us, we escape into fantasy. Like, we ignore reality. We don't wait for God to deliver us, so we attempt to deliver ourselves through fantasy. We escape, we medicate, uh, we play the victim. All of these things bring us comfort when we're in a place of suffering. Comfort is obsession for us. Comfort is industry for us. I'm always shocked when I see, um, like the new tractors are, are like nicer than my car. They have like AC. You've seen these tractors? I mean, incredible comfort. Crocs are a testimony to our obsession with comfort. Those like workout pants that all you girls wear. Like, so that we all think you just went to the gym when really they're just glorified sweatpants. It's like, I'm on my way to the gym. And it's like, no, those are sweats. They're comfortable. You're not headed to the gym. By the way, when I was trying to figure out the name of those workout pants, Taylor knew. Taylor knew that they were Lululemon yoga workout pants. It just brought me great comfort to out him. <laughs> comfort is Paul's obsession in this passage. It's his obsession in this passage. Ten times he mentions the word here. It would be impossible to miss the point of this passage. This word comfort only appears 31 times in the Bible. A third of all its uses come in just this brief passage. Comfort is the point of this passage. I mean, in some ways it's difficult to read because it's like we've received comfort to comfort those that are in need of comfort by the comfort that we've been comforted by. It's Paul's obsession and he's insisting here that comfort can be found in God. God brings comfort. He will comfort in all of your afflictions so that you'll be able to comfort others. Comfort can be found in God is what Paul's insisting on. I found myself asking the question as I looked at this passage is that what did Paul see what did Paul know? What did Paul experience that led him to believe that he was worshiping and serving the God of all comfort? What did he know? What did he see? 
What did he experience that brought him comfort? He was not comforted by a change in circumstances. In fact, his situation just gets increasingly uncomfortable. So it wasn't a change in circumstances that was bringing him comfort. What did he know? What did he believe? What did he see that brought him comfort in the midst of trouble, trial, and all kinds of suffering? What does comfort from God look like? Anyway, where does it come from? When does it come? What should we expect when we're hoping that God's going to bring us comfort? This guy, Paul, is, he says he's like overflowing in affliction. He's got affliction to go around. He's abounding in trouble. We don't know exactly what happened to Paul. We can just see the effects of what happened to Paul. I have no idea what happened in the province of Asia, which is modern-day Turkey, but we can hear about, we can see the effects of what happened on Paul. Have you ever looked at someone and you wonder what they've been through? You just look at them and you think the years have been rough. You have no idea what they've been through, but you know it's been tough. You can see the effects. You can see those long, hard years on their face. We can see the effects of what happened to Paul, but we don't know exactly what happened to Paul. He says, I don't want you to be unaware. And then he doesn't fill us in on exactly what happened. Guys, I don't want you to be uninformed. I don't want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. There's something physical happening. Most likely, he's taking a beating for the sake of the gospel. But this implies something different as well. And most people would say that they think that Paul experienced something of a nervous breakdown as a result of the pain. That it took a toll not just on his physical body, but on his emotions. And he is breaking down. And he's in full-blown despair. And then it says that God comforted him in not some of his afflictions, but that God comforted him in all of his afflictions. And as a result, he was able to comfort people in any affliction. In all of his afflictions, he was comforted by God. And now he is able to comfort you in any of yours. Like he could nod if you started to share with Paul what's going on. Mm. Yeah, felt that, seen that. The overflow of trouble led to an overflow of comfort. The overflow of suffering led to an overflow of comfort from Paul. He had so much comfort he could give it away. And now he's comforting these churches. And now... Years later, comforting Mark, comforting us. What did Paul know? What did he see? What did he experience? Nothing brings uh, a sense of comfort quite like a good report. Nothing puts you at ease. Nothing brings relief. Nothing brings comfort quite like a good report. I got the job. It's not cancer found my wallet. The sense of relief is almost tangible when there's good news or a good report. And Paul's theme throughout this whole letter that we'll be studying for the next six months is that there is a strange comfort that comes from the suffering, death, and resurrection of Israel's Messiah, Jesus. That there is a strange comfort that comes from his suffering, his death, and his resurrection. That there's something about the gospel, which is good news, that brings comfort even when what you've got is bad news. Paul is comforted because someone's gone before him. It brings us great comfort, right? 
to know that somebody else has faced it, to know that somebody else has blogged about it, to know that somebody else is asking the question on WebMD brings us great comfort, to know that it's been seen before, that someone's faced it before brings us tremendous comfort. And here's the idea, is that Paul seems to be saying, I take great comfort because Jesus has done it before me. And now, church, I want you to be comforted because I've done it. That this comfort is overflowing. That Jesus has faced it. He's gone through it. He's an example of how to work through it. And now Paul himself is working through it. And he's saying to the Corinthians, follow me as I follow Christ. I'm an example. And as an example, I can bring you comfort how to walk through suffering, how to walk through pain, how to walk through trial. Certainty and hope for the future. Paul's certainty of hope, his confidence for the future, is based on God's faithfulness in the past. We read it. He delivered us. He'll deliver us in the near future and He'll deliver us forever. This was so that we wouldn't rely on ourselves, but that we would trust God who raises the dead. His certainty, His certainty for the future, His confidence in the future is based on God's faithfulness in the past. So what happened to Jesus that is now overflowing into the life of Paul? And what happened to Paul that's now overflowing into the church at Corinth? What is this good news? What is this gospel that brought great comfort to Paul? The pinnacle of 1 Corinthians is an explanation of the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8, you can read it, but it says that Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior, died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried and He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. So what? What does this mean for us? What are the implications of this? That Jesus suffered according to the Scriptures, He died according to the Scriptures, and that He rose again. Good for Jesus. We've heard this before. What are the implications of this Gospel message for us? The good news of the Gospel is this, and it's repeated over and over again in 2 Corinthians. What happened to Jesus will happen to you. What happened to King Jesus, will happen for His people. And Paul is taking great comfort in this good news that someone's gone before Him and that what Jesus faced, He will face. And that His confidence for the future is based on God's faithfulness in the past. An event. God has done it. And I can sink my teeth into it. The letter returns to it over and over again. Jesus experienced suffering. He experienced affliction, he experienced death, and he experienced a resurrection. And Paul believes that these same things will happen to us. We'll experience suffering, affliction, death, and resurrection. That what happened to Jesus will happen to us and it's bringing him comfort. Jesus died so his people have died in him. They share in his sufferings. And Jesus rose, and so His people will rise again in Him and share in His resurrection life and power. This is bringing Paul great comfort. Hope that we'll one day live with a resurrected Jesus in a resurrected body on a resurrected planet is what is fueling Paul's comfort in this entire letter. He's still being persecuted. He's still in despair. He's still facing trial and trouble, yet he's receiving comfort from what? Where is he coming from? Paul's finding comfort in gospel. He's finding comfort in good news that what happened to Jesus will happen to us. He's also finding comfort from God because he knows that suffering is not a sign of divine displeasure. He knows that suffering is not a sign of divine displeasure. And again, he knows this because he's looking at the life of Jesus. Suffering is no longer a sign of divine displeasure. He starts by saying, 
He's, he's in a rough place, and he starts by praising God and saying, Blessed be the Father of all mercy, the God of all comfort. The idea in the ancient world was that illness and suffering was a sign that God was angry with you, that you were being punished for something. And we snicker and we laugh like, ha ha, so ancient, so primitive. But don't we all go there when we're facing suffering and affliction? What have I done that would warrant this? That this is and must be a sign of God's divine displeasure in my life. Paul's taking comfort and saying, no, no, no. Blessed be the Father of mercy. That is, he does not repay us as our sins deserve. And he is the God of all comfort. So no longer is Paul, when he faces suffering and affliction, thinking this is divine displeasure. But he's seeing an opportunity within it. The second thing I believe Paul sees, and it's bringing him comfort, even though his circumstances aren't changing, is that he knows that suffering has empowered his ministry and not disqualified him from ministry. That suffering and affliction, walking through that, has empowered ministry, gospel witness and ministry, not disqualified him from that. All of us know that when we walk through something difficult, that what the enemy intends for harm can actually take you on into something pretty significant. Suffering is certainly, and for us and for Paul, grounds to question the love of God. And he's saying, no, no, no. I'm not questioning God's goodness for me in this trial. I know he's the Father of mercy and the God of all comfort. So I am not questioning his goodness. And I'm not questioning his call on my life because I'm facing suffering and trial. I know that suffering and trial will empower ministry from my life, not disqualify me from ministry. This whole letter, if you've read it, if you knew we were going towards it and you read it like last week, this is all a defense of Paul's ministry. It's all a defense of his ministry. Paul had a bunch of critics and those critics contended that the suffering that characterized Paul's life was evidence that he was not an apostle. If you were the real thing, why are you going through so much suffering? If you're God's man, then it sure doesn't look that way to us because you can't seem to buy a break. You're unimpressive. You're weak. You're always going through something or dealing with something. And we believe, Paul, that this disqualifies you from ministry. And he's taking great comfort in knowing the affliction, the suffering that he experienced actually qualifies him to minister to others. That he's going to serve and support others out of those scars. That he's going to be in a place of need. God's going to come through and comfort him. And then he's going to comfort others with the comfort he received. He knows that it empowers ministry, not disqualifies. Again, we scoff at this, but we go here. We go here when we're in suffering. We think that this disqualifies us for ministry. Well, certainly I won't be able to do what God's put on my heart to do because of these setbacks. Much of our Christian thinking says that affliction is evidence for personal sin or deficient faith. That if you're going through suffering, if you're going through affliction, it's because you don't have enough faith. Faith, it's interesting, is not the thing that gets you through the trial and trouble. It's the thing that gets you around it. it helps you avoid it. And so there must be, if you're suffering, some sort of sin or deficient faith in your life. And if you were really a Christian, if you were really a minister, your life would be really, really slick. And that's what we like. That's what we prefer. The guy who's got it all together. Paul's saying here that this suffering that's come my way and then the comfort that God's given me is what qualifies me 
for ministry. We serve from our scars. Uh, we saw that in the video, you know. Mark, without a father, becomes a shepherd. And many people, not just his own daughters, look to him as a father. He received something from God. And now with confidence, he's giving it away. Now with confidence, he's saying, come on, come here. I will give you what I've received. This is true for those of you going through divorce. This is true for those of you wrestling with an addiction. You've got something to give away. If you've received comfort from God in this area, he will start to enable you to serve from your scars. If you've walked through miscarriages, whatever it is that you've faced, been a single parent, whatever it is that's going on for you, God intends to use it to empower you for ministry, not disqualify you from being used. The other thing that Paul's finding comfort in, and I'll, I'll end with this, is he's finding comfort in the truth that his pain has purpose. He is finding comfort that this affliction that has come his way has purpose, that the pain's on purpose. The word here used is, is intended, that this has an intended, um, a desired result in my life, that there's a purpose to this pain that I'm facing. Just a few chapters later in, in 2 Corinthians 4, Paul says, We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus. So that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake. So that this life may also be, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. I found it so interesting that he's saying like, this is for Jesus' sake, for Pete's sake, man. Whose sake is this for? A sake is purpose, reason, aim, end, objective, object, goal, motive. For the sake of clarity, for the sake of clarity, let's have this conversation. Paul knows that he's enduring suffering for the sake of Christ. He knows that it's on purpose, that it's intended. And he is resting in the rule of God over his struggle. It's bringing him great comfort, resting in the rule of God over his suffering, over his afflictions. That this isn't just chaos. That this isn't just disorder. There's something to this. God has a plan in this and it's bringing Him great comfort. One of the purposes is that we would draw on God. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. That we would draw on God in a new way as we're facing trial and struggle. How many know that this is true? Unfortunately, sad, but true. We wish it were not true, and it is absolutely true. Things are going well, you, you forget Him. Going through pain, suffering, trial, we find ourselves crying out to Him, relying on Him in a new way. The other thing that is bringing Paul great comfort is that this thing's cyc cyclical. It's intended, it's on purpose so that we'll draw on God. It's also on purpose because it is cyclical. There is an overflowing nature to affliction, pain, and suffering. And there is an overflowing nature to comfort. It doesn't terminate with Paul. It doesn't end with him. How many of you experienced when someone's grieving, it's, you have to grieve with them. You don't just show up and be like, hey, what movie are we going to see this afternoon? It's like, no, 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 you respect this. There's an overflowing nature to suffering. And there is an overflowing nature to comfort. And Paul sees that this thing is cyclical. That it's on purpose. That the comfort he receives from God, he's able to give away. It doesn't end with Paul. And that's bringing him great comfort. Mark, great example 
Uh, the Pausmas, we showed a video a mm, month ago, Jason, Ashley, how long ago? Two months ago, we showed a video that told Ashley's story of God bringing her comfort because she had four miscarriages. Were you here that Sunday? Really great video. God gave her an incredible dream, spoke to her, brought comfort to her. That video has 13,000 hits. That video has maybe, I'm just going to throw out numbers here. Eric, you can correct me. Way more than the funny ones that I make. Let's just put it that way. About 13,000 more than every other video I've made. (laughs) And that's because Ashley and Jason received comfort from God, and now it's bringing others comfort. We understand the cyclical nature of God's comfort. But what about you? What about you because it's not come full circle for you? For the Palasmas, they've got a little girl after they had four miscarriages. For Mark, the Lord brought him through and fathered him when he didn't have a father. But what about you? It's not come full circle. I want to bring just a word to the waiting. What if you are waiting on comfort from God? What if you're waiting for this thing to put a bow on it where we understand, is there any purpose to this? This is just chaos. This has not come full circle for me. I don't see the point in it. I don't even know if I'm relying on a God who raises the dead any more than I was prior to this. I don't understand what I'm in. What do I do if I'm waiting for this thing to come full circle? A few things that I see Paul doing in here. The first thing that I see is that he's praising God. If you are in the waiting right now, it's not come full circle. You're just in the thick of your affliction and pain. I want to encourage you to praise God. Paul is not out of the woods. And here he is saying to this church, Praise be to God, the Father of mercy, the God of all comfort who comforts us. In everything, in all the afflictions that we go through, comforting us, you can see that this is, a, this is a prayer, this is praise. Praise be to God. Praise is an incredible weapon. Paul knew how to use it, and he used it often. He used it in prison. He used it when he was suffering. He used it when he was facing trial. He would get his mouth moving. Why? Why? Is this like a fake it to make it type thing? Are we just supposed to be happy when everything's breaking down? Is that what Paul's inviting? It's for us to be phony when we're walking through struggle. That's not what he's inviting. Thanking God. Praising God. In a time of suffering, Paul thinks puts things back in order. That when you're going through a season that seems chaotic, and out of order. Praise is the weapon you use to put things back in order. Thankfulness is the weapon you use to put it all back in order. And Paul's saying, if you're waiting, continue to put it all back in order with praise. By thanking God. We align ourselves when we worship. We get aligned. We put God above our circumstances when we worship. Have any of you ever experienced the alignment that comes with a thank you? Where it's like everything gets put right again. I know some of you teachers. It's like it's chaos in the classroom. You're going to quit. You're going to quit on Monday. It's over. You're done. You can't take it anymore. And some kid looks up and says, Thank you, Ms. Braun. Thank you. And it's like everything is right again. I know my house is just chaotic. I'm convinced I have the worst kids in the world and therefore I'm the worst parent in the world. And then it's usually Finley, who's a little quieter than the rest, goes, thank you. And all of a sudden the world is right again until it gets all messed up again. (laughs) But that, that thank you, Penelope, we, we laugh like she's the best and the worst, like right now. And she, but she has this thing where she comes and she says, thanks, Dad, you're the best. And it's just like everything's right again. Something's put back in order when we praise. 
I was reading Romans 1. It's really interesting. Um, Paul writes, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. I mean, it sounds like real bad, right? The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and the wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God's made it plain to them, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power, His divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that the people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. All this wickedness, the wrath of God is against their wickedness because they're suppressing the truth. You want to know what the real problem is, Paul says? You want to know what's the root of all of that? They stopped saying please and thank you. They stopped recognizing that God was creator and they should ask before they engage. They stopped saying please and they stopped saying thank you. That's what led to the godlessness, the wickedness, the thing that is now bringing the wrath of God. They stopped saying thanks. You have to get your mouth moving if you're going through trial and trouble. And you've got to praise God. It's the weapon, it's the secret weapon that I believe if Paul were here, he would give us. Move your mouth, praise God, thank Him. There's something gets set, something gets put right when we praise God. We're back to what's intended, back to what God has ordered. The other thing I see here is prayer at the very end of this passage. You also, you must help me. He he says like, I'm so confident God's delivered me. God's going to deliver me in the near future. And ultimately, God will deliver me forever. I'm confident of this. Hey, could you pray for me? It's like, what is going on here, Paul? I am so sure. Hey, I need all you guys praying crank up the prayer chain because I don't know if I'm going to get through this. I am so confident that God's going to pull me through. Hey, could you pray for me? I am going through a tough time right now. But this is what Paul, this is the reality. So confident that God's going to bring him comfort and he's going to bring him comfort through the prayers of many. Many people are gathered praying for Paul. Don't stop contending. Don't stop asking. And the biggest deal is don't stop knocking. It's over and over and over again until somebody answers the door. Which leads me to the other thing I see here is patient endurance. In order to receive the comfort, you want to receive the comfort that comes from God. I know how to get comfort from the fridge. I know how to get comfort from sex. I know how to get comfort shopping. I know how to get comfort through entertainment. I know how to get comfort through fantasy. I know how to comfort myself those ways, Travis. How in the world do I get the comfort that comes from God? I'd rather have that. You've got to praise. You've got to continue in prayer. I'm so confident God's going to deliver me. Could you pray for me? Many people need to pray for me right now. Patient endurance. If you want the comfort that comes from God, you need patient endurance. Paul writes, you experience the comfort when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. What's worse than endurance? Patient endurance. What's, up, what's worse than patience? Patient endurance. The combination of those two words makes me feel sick. Not just patience, not just long suffering, long, long suffering. <laughs> if you want to experience the comfort that comes from God, then it's energized by patient endurance, that essentially the best things come to those who wait. Paul didn't bolt from his circumstances and he didn't curse God for his circumstances. He waited for the comfort that comes from God and he received it. And here's the thing, if you'll wait for the comfort that comes from God, then you'll be able to comfort others. If you run off and comfort yourself, you'll use others. If you wait and you patiently endure, and you get the comfort that comes from God, then you'll serve others. If you run off and comfort yourself, then you'll use others. You'll become a taker and not a giver. And Paul's saying when you patiently endure, when you wait for the good stuff, you're able to give good stuff away. You will lead people to the things that comfort you. 
You will be an evangelist for the things that comfort you. You've got to get some of these crocs. They're unreal. You just slip them on. You'll be an evangelist for the things that you know that bring you comfort. If that's the bottle, then you'll lead people to the bottle because the bottle is what brings you comfort. You must wait. I'm one of those people who like is a hard person to buy a gift for. Not because I'm picky, but because I buy it for myself when I want it. And I come home with it and my wife's looking at me like, I got you that for Christmas. It's in a closet. How come you couldn't wait two more weeks? Who buys themselves gifts on December 15th? What are you doing? Listen, if you buy it for yourself, then you can't receive it from God. You have to patiently wait for the comfort that comes from Him so that you can comfort others. The last thing that I see Paul doing here is he's giving away what he does have. How do you get the comfort that comes from God? Give away the comfort you have received. Because you have received something. Stop waiting for the end of the rainbow. Stop waiting for this thing to come full circle. It hadn't come full circle for Paul. And here he was, giving away the comfort he's received. And for some of us, we're waiting. Well, one day, when I finally do get a job, I'll comfort those people who are unemployed. You're unemployed right now, receiving comfort from God. Give away what you do have. Well, when I finally come through these miscarriages and we actually do have a child and we can stand and proclaim the goodness of God. No, right now in this season, you're receiving the comfort from God. Give it away. Paul's not come to the end of the rainbow. This has not actually come full cycle for Paul. He's giving away the comfort he has received. Some of you have received something. Don't wait for your child to come back to the faith. You have something to give away right now to other families that are walking through this. He has showed you something. Show it to others. He has given you comfort. He has said things to you. Give those things away and you'll receive the comfort that comes from God. Don't wait for the end of the rainbow. Some of you, I know, probably disqualified yourself this morning because you thought, man, the suffering that other people are facing is so much more significant than mine. So you compared yourself and your afflictions don't measure up. So therefore, God's probably got nothing for you because it's not gnarly enough for God to get involved. And for some of you, you're sitting here just in fear because you have this fear that to follow Christ means that inevitably you're going to suffer. It's like you're waiting for the other shoe to drop. Like that if I'm going to be really spiritual, something terrible is going to happen to me. And I just want to encourage you as we close this sermon on suffering that suffering isn't necessarily good. We're never told to seek suffering. Paul never says, go out and get it. Never told to seek suffering. We're never told that suffering is actually a Christian virtue. We are told that this is a page in God's textbook and that he uses it to do things that only suffering and affliction can do. My encouragement to you would be to rest in the rule of God. Worship team, would you guys come? Would you stand with me? God, I want to ask that you give us confidence for the future because of your faithfulness in the past. I want to ask that you would uh, speak a word that would bring uh, strength to the people here who are waiting for deliverance. I want to pray for strength, Lord, that we would experience your deliverance and that we wouldn't try to deliver ourselves by running to the things that comfort us. I want to ask that we'd get the real thing and we'd be able to comfort those who are needing the real thing. I pray, God, that you would convict us as we run to entertainment, as we run to gossip, as we run to self-pity. And you would remind us that you're the God of all comfort, that you actually have what we need. You're the Father of mercy. You're not waiting there to yell at us but you're longing to bring us comfort. Help us.
Help us get our Father facts straight. Help us to believe what Jesus believed about the Father. Thank you, Jesus, for trusting the Father in a really dark time so that we have an example of what it looks like to trust even though everything's breaking down. I just want to pray for strength for the moms who are waiting for prodigals to come home. Pray for strength for those that are waiting in singleness. I pray for those who are here needing comfort because they're lonely and continually going to substance or addiction to try to mask their loneliness. Come and be a friend. Bring comfort to hearts and to people here. Amen. We're going to serve communion and just remember what Christ has done, His body broken, His blood poured out. Also remember that we're a part of a body. We're a part of a body. And so when we're suffering, everyone suffers. When we're being comforted, everyone's being comforted. So feel free to engage and praise. Feel free to come to the table and remember Jesus. We'll see you guys next week. Thanks for listening. We want to be a resource for you as you walk with Jesus. So please connect with us at radiantbicelia.com. Until next time. Bye.